name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight is our class 29 of our Orthodox Survival Course. We're still in the book of Nihilism by Father Seraphim Rose. Last week we started the stages of the nihilist dialectic, and we dealt with what he called liberalism and what he called realism. Lib briefly, to summarize, liberalism is this school of thought in which uh, they are so-called enlightened people who are indifferent to the Christian revelation, but they like the results of Christian civilization. They like to have the beauties and the order and the, the, the uh, advantages created by centuries of the church's tradition, but they don't like the teachings of the church. So they try to create a, uh, uh, either a Christian humanism or just a secular humanism that's not openly hostile to Christianity. And uh, then that, the, the, but the, their indifference to truth, their indifference to ultimate questions provokes this rage on the part of the radical materialists who create what uh, Father Seraphim calls realism. So it's also just, could be called sheer philosophical materialism, where they only believe in their senses. And they, and they believe, they claim to believe in science, that science has solved all problems and science gives us ultimate truth. But tonight we're going to talk about the stage three vitalism. I was hoping to get through stage three and four, but when I started doing the notes, vitalism went on for so long, I figured I could probably, only, probably cover that tonight. Um, and actually, next week we're going to talk about nihilism of destruction, and also we're going to talk about what Father Seraphim calls a theology of nihilism. There is an anti-theology, an anti-philosophy, anti-metaphysic, anti-theology of nihilism. But vitalism is also a stage of nihilism. It is a type of nihilism. And we're going to talk about what that means. The liberal indifference to truth leads to this, as I was saying just now, leads to this realist or materialist rage for the truth, which they define as pure materialism. Now, you had this. You, you know, I don't know if you ever met any of these. At least in the early years of communism, there were actually people who righteously believed in economic uh, and uh, especially even philosophical materialism and determinism. That was, a, that was a, their religion. You know, and they, they originally believed in that. Uh, they believed in science, um, and uh, there are people today who still, you know, their their creed is the so-called science. Because as we were saying last week, it's not science, properly speaking, but scientism, a naive belief that's that so-called science gives us all truth. So they they they're in the, the the realist asks the ultimate question. And he says, "Well, everything's just matter." But the realist scientific paradise that they want to create, this total technocratic control, uh, where everybody just becomes just sort of a material piece of machinery going through the motions, right? It's, hortifi it's horrifying to the human spirit. It's stifling. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Metropolis, yeah. Fritz Lang's uh, Metropolis, and the masses are just huddled and they're just marching into the factory. You know, that's the world that the, the, the sci scientists, so-called the scientism believers, the technocrats, they want to create that kind of a world where the vast majority of mankind are just soulless robots just going through the motions, it's and free on the internet. It's, it's, it's on the internet, Metropolis, uh, by Fritz Lang. Right. Yes. It's a lot of occult. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of occult stuff. So Metropolis shows the, the technocratic or realist um, vision of the future, right? Where everybody's just controlled by a technocratic elite. Fritz Lang's, uh, another one of his uh, famous movies, or his, his uh, dramatization of the Nibelungenlied, um, you might say is a vitalist movie. Right, it's 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 uh, in the tradition of Wagner and the, the glorification of German mythology. So this realist scientific, so-called pseudo-scientific, early paradise of total technocratic control, pure materialism is horrifying to the human spirit. Right, you react to it because it's so it's so deathly. Right. So vitalism, of course, vita, vitalism is from vita in Latin, which means life. Lifeism. Uh, li vitalism is a reaction says no, we must have life, spirit, creativity. Mysticism, the transcendent. We want to have intense emotional experiences. We want to feel that we transcend the humdrum, the day-to-day, -day, the mere, merely material interests. We want to go beyond. We want, we want to have intense feeling. Uh, we want to express ourselves. We don't want to be crushed by this um, technocratic juggernaut. We don't want to be just pieces of this scientific machine. We don't want to believe that we're just pieces of matter. We have to have some... Uh, uh, intense experience to make us feel alive. Okay. But the remedies proposed by vitalism are themselves not an antidote. They just do positive harm. They're not cures. They're, in, rather, in, in the author's words, symptoms of a more advanced stage of the disease. It's, an, it's a reaction, right? All this goes in action and reaction. And uh, so this is the reaction. But, it, but, of course, the only 
real antidote is to return to Christ and really to return to orthodoxy, which for the West would be very hard because they were separated from so many hundreds of years and they were so pleased with themselves. Um, the, so Father Seraphim points out that the fundamental error of vitalism is that it accepts the presupposition of liberalism and realism that Christ, the Christian revelation is not true. There's also starting from that same stony point, you know, that Christ is just another myth. Now they might like the myth because they like myths, right? They like drama and myths and, uh, and the fantastic so for some of them, some of them even become sort of neo-Christians, neo-Catholics, neo-Protestants, and so forth. I'm afraid of not, not a few neo-Orthodox as well. Like, for example, a, a character like Vladimir Solofiev, who created a whole theology based on visions he had of someone he called Sophia. So he was in, in Prelast. Um, so, th they, so they don't really believe that, that, that the scriptures are true. So, th so vitalism is just a restless search for life and activity and mysticism that transcendent with no solid basis. It's not based on anything that they agree is true. They just, just, it's experience for the sake of experience, feeling for the sake of feeling, and endlessly restless, endlessly searching. Its search for the transcendent is a parody of true religion. Just a bigger comment was found that in our bodies we have a lot of parasites, a lot. Mm -hmm. There are some parasites uh, of which they affect it. Rest, restlessness. Restlessness. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's start, a physiological... It starts a business. You know, something always... So you're saying that these are microscopic organisms, parasites, yeah. that create the feeling of restlessness. Exactly. Yeah. But, it, but, but uh, there probably are... No, but this is something else. But, but there well, probably I'm are... There is another... There's a physiological thing. aspect, yes. And there are probably dietary ways, and then also, most importantly, spiritual um, antidotes for this, right? Or or medical. And, and, and medical. Um, but this is a this vitalism though is yeah, a whole this is, this, is a, this is a whole philosophy or a whole spirit of restlessness right it's make believe <laughs> for grown ups <laughs> all this vitalism is just make believe for grown ups that's all it is and uh, and it, but it has serious consequences make when, you, when the grown ups are just their whole life is make believe that has very serious consequences because the grown ups are in charge right so in their lives are make believe when that you know when a little child is doing make believe well that's part of their natural development right when the grown ups are trapped in a world of make believe. It's it's not good, right? Consequence. It has consequences. It definitely has consequences. These ideas have consequences. So in pages forty three to forty five of the book, the author talks about vitalism as an anti Christianity. So vitalism is a pseudo religion, and sometimes its adherents claim to be Christians of some kind, right? But it leads to subjective fantasy. Sometimes it leads to outright Satanism, which it it actually did. I mean, uh, the um the the practitioners of nihilism on the political stage are often uh, members of secret societies where they practice, they get their thrills, they get their, their, their transcendent experience through, through um, the occult, right? And in vitalism, there's a rootless eclecticism and syncretism. Words, we see this in Europe, of course, if we, if we go back to Father Seraphim's model that the, the high point of vitalism as a stage is the late 19th and, and, and early 20th century leading up to World War I, we see in the European elites and especially the British elites. The British elites are an important barometer because at that point, the British Empire rules a great deal of the world, right? And they, they have a great influence on what's, what's considered prestigious, what's considered culture. And uh, we see the British elites are especially jaded. They are especially um, uh, restless and searching for some kind of uh, transcendent or exciting experience. We see in this in the novels, very degenerate, author named E.M. Forster, who wrote novels called Room with a View, uh, Voyage to India, um, uh, and, and, and uh, they're about bored uh, Victorian or Edwardian English upper class people looking for thrills among the darker races, right, going to India, or even darker European people, like going to Italy or somewhere like that, and trying to experience the thrill of something irrational, something romantic, something exciting and, um, and uh, discarding their entire moral code is something totally irrelevant and, and uh, hypocritical. So it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a pre hippieism you know, all those rules, all those morals, they're, they're, they're all washed up now. We're just going to be excited. We're going to be exciting and excited. We're going to search for thrills. So we see the, this is the great, the great, uh, interests of the English upper classes in, uh, in Middle Eastern uh, culture. Uh, Sir Richard Burton, who, who translated the Arabian Nights, 
well, this kind of the Englishman who'd go off and they'd learn Arabic and they'd wander around and, and they'd, they'd smoke hashish and, and um, try to go native, so to speak. This is all part of this vitalism. Okay? So there's root, rootless eclecticism, trying to gather from all different cultures and create a, uh, this synthetic pseudo-culture, uh, but just, just going to each culture and trying to find the most exciting or the most exotic or the most bizarre aspects of every culture and, and uh, putting that all together. In a, in a kind of a toxic cocktail. <clears throat> Father Seraphim points out that spiritualism, and this all leads to spiritualism, they're trying, to, they're trying, a lot of these people really are trying to get in touch with demons. They want to. They want to be in touch with spirits. Another phenomenon at the same time in England, and also in America, is the growth of spiritualism, where they'd get, it, they'd get together in meetings, and they would say they would invoke spirits. They'd try to have seances and try to talk to the spirits of the dead. They'd try to in invoke just spirits in general. Also, this this movement gave birth to Theophysy, Madame, Bl Madame Blavatsky and Theosophy. Okay? And all, all of these bizarre and degenerate, um, uh, syncretistic and pseudo-theological movements. But they um, real. Pardon? Oh, they had real experiences. Oh, yes. Real ex oh, they had real experiences. Oh, yes. They asked for it. And you, if you ask for it, you get it. And uh, if you've been an Orthodox priest long enough and you've exorcised baptized, catechized enough people in our society, you, you've you met people, either people who are raised in the church and got involved in this, or people who are coming from outside the church as adults. And uh, the experiences, I, obviously I can't reveal these things, but no one could fool me about the, the existence or non-existence of the demonic, because people have, and it starts with so-called, quote-unquote, innocent things, right? Uh, uh, some teenage girl staying up at midnight with a Ouija board, um, there, there's an account in the life of the elder Ambrose of Optina um, of a woman who was healed by the elder um, both before and after his repose, and she, she got into a life, a decades-long, almost lifelong torment by demons by telling fortunes on New Year's Eve. They, they, the Rus Russian teenagers would do this, they, the girls especially. They'd get together on New Year's Eve and look in the mirror, and they they try to see visions of the future, things like that. And uh, there's even, I think, uh, Tolstoy depicts this in War and Peace, where Natasha and uh, Sonia do this uh, on New Year's Eve. And uh, this woman, the, the demons entered into her, and even though she, she went through all kinds of spiritual struggles, and eventually was healed, but it took decades, see. And so, but this vitalism as a movement, of course, there's always been this problem going back to the beginning of the world, right, the problem of fighting demons. But vitalism as a movement in our time glorifies this they cover it up. They don't, they don't call it demon. They call it spirits or the transcendent or being spiritual. You'll often, today, you'll meet people who will say, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Well, what does that mean? Well, I don't have, I, I don't believe all, the, all those things the priests teach, or I don't believe in organized religion, but I'm just in touch with spiritual powers, good energies, and, and so forth. Well, you know, we know what kind of energies they're in touch with. Okay? So it opens you up to the demonic realm, all this, all this stuff. Um, vitalism is also more dangerous than liberalism and realism. Why? Because liberalism and realism as philosophies were only believed in by a small elite. Right? It, only, only the, uh, the socioeconomic elite thought about and believed in liberalism, the ideas of liberalism, or the ideas of science, strict scientific determinism. You know, and the, the silly, uh, the naive evolutionists who really believe in it, the ones who don't know they're being used as fools. They, just, they really believe in evolution. They're always frustrated. They can't get the public to accept evolution. You know, if you do polls, you find out that still 70% of the American public doesn't believe in evolution, right, because it's so self-evidently ridiculous. Okay? So you, you can't get the, 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 these... Um, you, you have to be over-educated to believe in stupid things like, like, like scientific uh, or deterministic materialism. Okay? So the more ordinary people don't believe in these things, but more ordinary people are thirsting and hungering for excitement, they're hungering for uh, spiritual or really pseudo-spiritual experience. They're they're hungering for the bizarre, the exotic, the new. Okay, that's just a normal pathology of all people. So vitalism appeals, whereas these first two stages were sort of the property of the elite, the the overeducated elite, right? Who'll believe anything, um, <clears throat> whereas who've lost all common sense will believe anything. But vitalism appeals to the masses. Um, and so this carries forward the nihilist program, because like Christianity, nihilism does claim universality. And nihilism says, I am the new orthodoxy. So vitalism is a stage where now they capture the masses. See, So the elites 
can think about the death of God. The, the elites can go to a cocktail party, and so the death of God, yes, that's an interesting idea, you know, the death of God. We'll talk about it. But for an ordinary person, the death of God is horrifying, it's terrifying. Something has to fill that vacuum. Right? Something has to get, They have to have a God of some kind. They're trying to find a spiritual solution. So that's the appeal of vitalism. So I, 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 um, my, uh, my Protestant church is really boring, and I can't believe in this liberal political philosophy, and I can't believe in this stupid um, scientism. But so I'm, and, and, and uh, I don't believe in Christ, but I need something in my life. So I'm going to uh, go to seances. I'm going to go to spiritualist meetings. I'm going to uh, just get captivated by uh, going to operas and reading novels like Frankenstein and things like that to, to have Im imaginary uh, pseudo-spiritual experiences, to transcend my ordinary life. Aliens. Hmm? Aliens. aliens. Yeah, today aliens. Yes, today it's aliens. And yes. UFO cults and of course now the drug cults and so forth. <clears throat> so what are the general characteristics of vitalism as the author explains them in the uh, 8th through 13th paragraphs of the section, pages 45 to 48 mm -hmm. if you have the hard copy. <coughs> so pseudo-mysticism, you know, it's phony religion, right? Or demonic religion. And the irrational urge for having an intense experience being excited, excitement, right? That's always existed. That's part of fallen human nature, right? To want to be excited all the time, or to want or to be excited frequently, right? Or, or to get in touch with spiritual powers. You see, this is part of fallen nature. What makes the vitalism of the modern times different is that, and he, he points out three differences. One, it exists on a vast scale. It's not just some individual pathology. It's this vast movement where it captures masses and masses of people, right? And secondly, he said the remedy of common sense doesn't work on it. How often we've had we've often had the experience of trying to appeal to people's common sense. It just doesn't work anymore. And you, you wonder what happened. <laughs> Why doesn't common sense work? Oh, common sense. For example, somebody says, "Well, I've gone to a meeting of this cult, and we we talk to spirits." I say, "No, come on, that's ridiculous." But that doesn't work anymore. No, because it was real. Well, it was real. Yeah, they were having a real experience. Yes. But just appealing, just telling them, you know, that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. You know, don't you, don't you realize? When I say that's ridiculous, I don't mean that it didn't happen. What I mean, what I meant was, don't do that. You know that. Don't you think that that's foolish? Uh, that that's you're opening up yourself. You're opening yourself up to things that are harmful. But that doesn't work anymore for for a large number of people, right? And see, its growth. What's suspicious or suspect about this vitalism? So the growth of vitalism parallels the lessening of the influence of the church. They're inversely proportionate. So if something healthy, it wouldn't be growing in inverse proportion to the influence of the church, right? So, <clears throat> vitalism, and he, point, he makes an interesting uh, point. He says, we, we associate vitalism with the, um, say, the mass rallies at Nuremberg or the pseudo-mysticism of the Marxist believers, right? These political, political causes that are so exciting and that enlist people's uh, irrational loyalty. He says, but actually, it, vitalism is actually more advanced in the so-called liberal countries. Because it's the, the the vitalism the vitalism in the eastern countries was intense, but that political program died. Right, it, it, the, the, the political programs always die. Okay, but culturally, the vitalism is actually more advanced in the western countries, in the liberal countries, and we can see that with the fall of all the eastern European regimes, whether so-called fascist or so-called Marxist. We see that it's the western, quote unquote, western or freer liberal version or democratic version of vitalism that's invading. The, Orthodox countries and just capturing the people's minds, you know, with all the different rock music and, and uh, science fiction and, and all this stuff. It's just all, it's all there. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Another aspect of vitalism is that is widespread and utterly bizarre crime. Crime, and not, not, not just crime as part of human, you know, part of fallen nature. We've always had crime, right? There have always been criminals, murderers, thieves, and so forth. But now crime takes on this exciting, almost attractive uh, character for a lot of people. I was, when I was, uh, last year where I was introducing everybody to Tiram Sorokin, I was rereading Sorokin's The Crisis of Our Age. He's going back to the 19th century and, and he pinpointed the rise of crime literature as a mark of a degenerate society. The, the de detective novel was born in the 19th century and the, the fascination with crime and crime is sort of a transcendent experience, right? They're breaking bounds. And the and the and the and the, the more and more sacred boundaries they transgress, the more exciting it becomes. So that the most 
the, the people deprecate the most horrible crimes. Oh, how could that happen? Oh, that's terrible. But secretly, they're excited by it. They're attracted. They make movies about it. Right? Truman Capote, this degenerate, uh, perverted author, wrote uh, you know books where he he became a bestseller, a uh, bestselling author. You know, glorifying crime. Of course, he would say he wasn't glorifying it. He was just depicting it. TV nightly. Oh, the nightly news. Yeah, you don't even have to read novels anymore. People don't read anymore. They just have to watch the news, look at the internet. And, um, and uh, sensationalistic journalism, of course, besides the novel, sensationalistic journalism, what used to be called yellow journalism, sensationalized crimes, the crime of the century, you know, the most bizarre crime. Christ. Yeah, the, the, oh, Agatha Christie's mild. I mean, that's just, <laughs> Agatha Christie is, you know, uh, passe. passe, that's, that's nothing. <laughs> but the, the fascination with the crime, more, really the, the American crime, crime writers like um, Dashiell Hammett, where they just they they just glorify the the um, the very the violence and the crudeness of the whole thing. This is really the vitalistic spirit. Um, so um, the criminals act on an impulse to do the most horrible things. They show no remorse. This is a thing of these serial killers. For example, the famous Son of Sam killer in New York. He said he was hearing voices and they were telling him to do these things. Right? It's it's obviously demonic, but it, it's demonic. And people should say, no, that's demonic. We hate that. That's bad. But no, they're fascinated by it. They're attracted to it. They're still fascinated by Charles Manson and, um, and all these kinds of things. Okay? They, they've, um, the fascination with the Kennedy assassination, it's not just a fascination. It's not just pa patriotic concern about our country. Well, who killed the president and so forth. It's, a, it's almost an occult fascination with the whole act as a ritual of, of murdering this, this man. And um, so that this is all part of it. Father Seraphim also mentions as another aspect of vitalism the cult of speed, going faster and faster, you know, going faster and faster. Uh, you know, the, with the invention of the automobile, um, people became really obsessed with going as fast, see if they can make this machine go as fast as it could. Of course, back when you just had horses, well, people liked to ho race horses too, right? People liked to go fast, like men like to, young men like to go fast, right? It's part, again, part of fallen human nature. But, but when, before you had, these machines, you can only, a, a horse can only go so fast, right? A sailing ship can go only so fast. Uh, but once they have these machines or they think that there are no limits, then they're always trying to go faster and faster and faster. And why? See, it becomes, it, it's, it's a really, it's this, because of their, their emptiness and they have this, this insatiable desire for intensity of experience. They have to go faster and faster. If they're not risking their neck, they don't feel alive, okay? And that's really a pathology. It's a spiritual pathology. But it's part of this vitalism. You know, my life is empty. My spirit is empty. I have no other. I don't have a spiritual life, so I just have to have this intensity of experience. So drugs. You start as marijuana. It's like a drug. Yeah. It's like a drug. And on and on. Right. Um, obviously, we know that TV and the cinema are hypnotism, a form, or, or methods of hypnotism, and the fragmentation of the mind. So they both they they hypnotize you and then they fragment the mind. And I've noticed. You know, I I had not seen movies for a long time. New movies. I mean, I'll watch. So I like, there are some old movies I like, and I'll watch them now and then. But um, now and then I'll get talked into going to see some new movie. So I'll go see it. And after five minutes, I walk out. <laughs> and then, but what I notice about the new movies is that they're constantly switching from one scene to another. Boom, 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 boom. There's no plot line. So even if, even if you, you know, even so-called traditional theater is still not Christian. But at least if you, you want to see a well-written play, they, there was a plot and there was dialogue. <laughs> there was development of characters. But in the movies now, they're just, they're just, they've got to the point where they don't need to have a plot or they don't want to have a plot. They just shift from one yeah, scene to another. Watch line. There's no line. There's no, there's no, no continuity. Yeah. It's hypnotism. Yeah. It's yeah. But the hypnotism is so advanced, they don't need to do anything. It doesn't have to make any sense at all. Yeah. But this started a long time ago. Though. They're just, it's, at a, it's at a point now where it's just completely um, ridiculous. The people are primed. They're prime for it, yeah. So, father, back in 1960, 62, so if Eugene Rose is writing this book in 1962. He talks about the savage character of jazz. Yeah. Nowadays, people think jazz is something old-fashioned compared to rock, right? But jazz itself, jazz is an irrational, vitalist art form, right, appealing to savage instincts. The word jazz is, was actually Negro slang for something we don't talk about. And, and the, the art form, so-called, was born in my native city, in New Orleans, in houses of ill repute. And it was the music they were playing in those places, you see. So jazz is, again, again the, 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 the jaded, 
bored white people are going to the darker races to get in touch with their animal instincts and to, to become enthralled with, with um, uh, primitive or degenerate art forms. Um, so he talked about jazz, what would he, you know, rock, I mean, forget it. Of course, by the time Father Seraphim passed away in 82, the, the rock revolution had occurred. You know, there's a, um, there are interesting descriptions. You know, the, the, the um, Elvis Presley started this in the 50s, and there was the great, one of the great um, landmarks in American cultural degeneracy is when Elvis Presley was on the Ed Sullivan Show. The Ed Sullivan Show was a show that every, every middle-class American family watched on Sunday nights in the 50s and early 60s. I remember it. I remember being a little child at my grandmother's house and watching Ed Sullivan on Sunday night. And they allowed Elvis Presley to come on. And, and, but at first, they would only show him the first time. I think the first time he appeared, they showed him only from the waist up. But then they showed him the movements he was making with his thighs and with his legs. Yeah. And the form of the savage, obviously suggestive, lewd dancing that he was doing. And that was, that was the first time in American television that, that, move, that even that kind of bodily movement was shown. And to think, uh, think how much we've changed. Uh, to people in 1959, six, whenever it happened, that was shocking. It was very disturbing. Many people protested. They weren't allowed. To yeah. The parents, the parents wouldn't let him watch. Right. It was considered so lewd. But now that's considered old-fashioned almost, you see. And then, of course, in the next step, in the 60s, were the Beatles in England, in America. Um, of course, they spread all over the Beatle mania, spread all over the world. And what's interesting, if you read about the Beatles, that they were a boring group going nowhere. Nobody cared about them. And, and then one night, they were playing at a club in Liverpool, and all the girls in the audience just started screaming and going crazy. Because it was obviously demonic. There was no, they played, the music they played was no different from the night before. But all the girls just started screaming. There was a, a mass hysteria that took hold of them. He had a handler. Yes, he had a handler. And, and there are, there's, there's a lot of evidence that he actually did make a pact with the devil. No, but physically. Oh, yes, he had person. Civil. Yeah, yes. Oh, sure, of course. The, the usual, <laughs> usual suspects were managing their career and making money off of them. But this, but this phenomenon of Beatlemania was a mass hysteria induced by demonic powers. And the murder of John Lennon was a ritual murder. The, the, the man who killed him was a fan who had been told by voices right, to go kill him. He knelt in front of him like in worship, and he killed him like as a, as a sacrifice. Okay. So this is, uh, the, the, but, but, the, but the, the screaming and the hysteria of the Beatles, uh, the Beatle audiences, really can, is, goes back to, we were talking last week about opera. And, and how opera would, in the 19th century, opera would captivate people and they'd, they'd go into a transcendent state almost, a hypnotized state. We talked especially about the, the, the mythic, uh, overwhelming power of Wagnerian opera. Um, and, uh, and, and then the, the seductive, uh, lascivious or degenerate character of Italian opera, which is trapped people in lower passions of sensuality and lust and so forth, or the, or the Wagnerian opera to, to give people this thrill of of violence and destruction, transcendence, violence experiences transcendence. Um, another aspect of, of vitalism is the cult of sport and the cult of youth, right? glorifying youth, the vitality of youth, trying to experience youthfulness. You know, where uh, at one time, we, uh, as people grew older, they were more respected. Now people only respect you if you act silly, you, you act young. I remember, and th th this, this foolish idea even captures older people um, I remember talking to a, um, an elderly Russian emigre back in the 1980s, and I was deploring uh, the habits I saw in elderly people now, the, of the elderly women dressing like young women and going off to dances. And he said, what's wrong with that? They should have a good life. They should live it up. And uh, instead of being a sober person and preparing for death, and also um, being a model to younger people of sobriety, of gravity, of uh, seriousness, it was just, oh, just act young till you die. And uh, this is, uh, it's, it's very antithetical to, 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 to Christian life. And of course, the cult of sport, this obsession with sport. I don't know how many sport networks we have now, I mean, how many cable networks are devoted to sports, 24-hour sports, every kind of sport imaginable. And, uh, but this started uh, a long time ago. It, it, it's really, again, um, I hate to blame my cousins, but it, it really is, the British started this, this really started in Britain with the, the glorification of sport, but it spread to the, the influence of the British Empire, it, it spread the, through, through, through that, and then, um, the, and, and then it spread, of course, it also in continental Europe, 
it, it, it became an obsession. The elder Ambrose of Optina uh, once made, he, he had a prophecy, he said there is this new sport called soccer, well football in Russian, say football. He said it will destroy millions of souls. It will destroy millions of souls because it's a substitute religion, right? Whether it's the soccer stadium in Europe or the American football stadium in America, it's a, it's a substitute for the church. Especially professional sports, when do they do them? On Sunday afternoons, on Sundays. Pardon me? And, uh, or Saturday night, Sundays. Was this mm -hmm. sport. Except sports. sports. They, they glorified, they glorified. They, and they say, well, it's, it's, for he it's for the young people's physical fitness. We don't need to devote mm -hmm. billions of dollars and uh, round-the-clock obsession uh, to sport for children to be physically fit. They have exercise, they can go hiking, they, they put learn. Them to work. Put them to work. Yes, they can work. <laughs> they can do actual work. But now, well, yes, now even, yeah, the, they're the ones who don't want to play sports. They just want to sit with a video thing. But that's another, that's another thing. And so, of course, now they say, well, I don't want my, my boy to be uh, addicted to video games. I'll just have him play sports all the time, you see. Um, the sites, mm -hmm. they get more and yes, more. Yes, more and more and more. And more. Yes. And the parents will spend thousands of dollars yeah, on true. uniforms, and trips, um, so forth and so on. Yes, well, the, it's, again, the cult of sport. The parents are remaining adolescent in their outlook. They say, well, I'm spending time with my children, but you're actually, you're, you're, um, you're just li reliving your youth or reliving your, trying to stay immature by being obsessed with these uh, uh, superficial and unworthy um, activities. Um, and then, of course, another aspect of vitalism is sexual license, being open, experimental, and therefore good. So the old, the old liberals, the 19th century liberal, might have been uh, the upper classes were kind of degenerate in secret or quietly, okay? but this vitalist literature that pushes the edge of of um, morality is glorifies uh, this kind. Of, so in the nineteenth century, you have the explosion of romantic novels and proto-feminism, where glorifying the emancipation of the woman and um, her experimenting and her pushing the boundaries of traditional. Uh, societal mores and so forth. And of course, today that's just it's way beyond everything. Um, rebellion against authority. So, so the 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 vitalist revolt against the technocratic elites, but it's sponsored by the same people who control the technocratic elites. <laughs> where it's where it's the 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 liberal the liberal governments and the and the the technocrats create this soulless, money driven. Uh, boring machine of a society they're funding that they're controlling that but then they're also funding the anarch the stupid uh, young people who are acting like anarchists and throwing bombs and screaming and they're the ones who join antifa and black lives matter and occupy wall street and back in the 60s it was the students for democratic society and the black panthers they're being funded by the same people they're supposedly protesting against right who are the people who who control the techn the technocratic machine so vitalism they're feeling this vital impulse to rage. They call it rage against the machine. If you ever see a, a bumper sticker, rage against the machine, that's kind of a, a kind of a silly, uh, superficial leftist student idea of the university student revolting against the, the establishment. Well, they don't realize they're being funded. That that bumper sticker was paid for by the establishment, right? And uh, so it's 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 just rebellion against God. The, 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 what they really hate, they hate God, right? And it's antinomian. It's against law. They they hate legitimate authority, right? They hate anything when anyone that tells them, no, you may not follow your impulses, you may not do whatever you want. That the God, there's there is a God. He has a law for us, and we have to obey His law. And that's what they they can't. They hate that, right? It's a revolt against legitimate authority. They hate what they really hate is God. <clears throat> so all of this is restless, pointless activity. Well, pointless from a from any healthy point of view. It's not pointless. The demons have a point. They have a purpose for it, which is destruction. But it's really pointless activity. It's indulging the passions. All of this is all of all of these manifestations really are just uh, unleashed in, indulgence of the passions. Okay? And uh, but but it's a, it's glorified. It becomes a new cultural norm, and it's 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 glorified as and and they write you know people get PhDs you know writing about the philosophy of revolt and philosophy of rock music and philosophy of um, sexual immorality and so forth as these positive interesting advanced ideas you know people in the United States you can found a church based on demonism and get a tax exempt status you know so so the, these are this is we're not just talking about sin or uh, de demons that have always existed we're talking about a widespread um, 
possession <laughs> of vast masses of people of, of uh, the, all these being, of being um, addicted to the activities involving satisfying these impulses and a, a great deal of activity that is actually directly demonic. Okay. He talks briefly about vitalism and politics. The most obvious vitalist movements in the 20th century were those that created pseudomystical excitement through mythological mass rituals. Okay. Um, if you ever, you ever, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Triumph of the Will, it's a, it's this the, the 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 cinematographer is actually a woman, Lainey, I think her name is Lainey Eifenstrahl or something like that. German. German. And uh they created this movie of the glorifying the Nazi party and the it was it was mostly shot at the Nuremberg rallies. And uh you just see the mystical power of this thing. The mystical power of the Hockenkreuz, the swastika, these vast red banners, masses and masses of people screaming, shouting all together, and um and you, you watch, and of course, Hitler was a great orator. And you, you watch the you, you you watch the power of these speeches, and the the the, the vast the, the the irrational excitement that would fill thousands and thousands of people. So this is some this is a um, the, so the legitimate aspects of their political program. I'm not talk, I'm not talking about a criticism of the the aspects of their political program. Many actually many aspects of the nationalist or so-called fascist political programs were actually good. I mean, they were needed. Um, to retain national sovereignty, to get rid of dependence on international finance, uh, to reassert uh, people's confidence in their past, in their nation, and so forth. But the, the problem with all these movements is that, again, they didn't return to the church. They were creating a new mythos, uh, whether it was uh, Mussolini or Hitler, um, they, were, they were creating a mythos apart from, apart from the church. To a greater or less extent, they may have cooperated with, with the Catholic Church in their countries, or cooperated with the Protestant churches in their countries. They're creating this, they're creating, a, and this is based on the 19th century myths, national myths created by anti Christian or Masonic elements that infiltrated all the nationalist movements in the 19th century. And it got in touch with this vitalist current, right? Getting people excited about um, not a Christian, but a mythological understanding of themselves. And a worship not of not the nation worshiping Christ, but worshiping themselves. And Christ is just part of the national heritage, perhaps. A difference actually is the the Franco and Salazar regimes, uh, governments in Spain and Portugal, were not part of this. Um, they were called fascists too. Of course, remember they'll identify anybody. They call anybody a fascist. I mean, they, anyone who loves his country, or wants to enforce laws, or you know doesn't want to be taken over by international finance is called a fascist. But um, which we see with General Franco, for example, here's someone who just kept the, kept the communists from slaughtering thousands of Catholic priests and nuns and blowing up churches. But he, he had to use, uh, he of course he used the military and, and, and he, he had to be tough. And uh, frankly, I mean, uh, you know, Spain between, between the end of the Spanish Civil War and the 1970s, Spain was probably the nicest place to live in Europe. Um, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not quoting this from Father Seraphim to criticize all of what's called fascism, but to point out the vitalist aspect of these uh, pseudo-mystical cults that were created um, by people who really were neo-pagans. Hitler was a, he, he may have had some love for his country or whatever, but he was a neo-pagan. And also, <laughs> it's, been revealed, it's been revealed through the research of people like Anthony Sutton and David Irving that Hitler was also funded by the same people, and uh, they, they brought him to power for the destruction of the German people, which is exactly what happened. To bring in the communism. Yeah. To Central and, to, and, and it brought communism into, into Europe. That's right. The, the, the destruction of Germany brought communism to half of Europe. So vitalism in art. <clears throat> Vitalist art, so-called, is a revolt against realism and naturalism in art. It exalts the exotic, the bizarre, the disturbing. They go to primitive and savage cultures to find freshness, when in fact they're just finding things that are degenerate and demonic. You know, you go, you go into these uh, these wealthy uh, English aristocrats, and they have African masks all over the place, or you know, which things that are obviously demonic. Uh, but but they they're tired and they're bored with their uh, materialistic European approach to life, and they want to find something on the edge, right? It's exciting. That's partakes of the the mysterious, and um, so that they go off and and uh, get interested in all these degenerate and demonic things from from lower cultures. Uh, so the artist is exalted as a demigod, right? The artist is a genius who must not be bound by traditional morality or traditional artistic canons. 
Yeah, don't, don't disturb him. He's a genius. Don't criticize his work. You don't understand. He's such a genius. For some of these geniuses, people like Picasso would admit that, that they, they were total cynics. They did it just for money, and they, they knew their stuff was horrible. There's a, there's a passage. I forget where it was. I was talking about Picasso, and he said, you know, all this was a scam. I just I didn't believe in this stuff. That was a scam, too. He had, yeah, there were, yeah, it wasn't just for money. It was, it was, it was definitely demonic. Yeah. And uh, so what matters is not truth, but feeling. Uh, another key moment in the, the something, an earlier form of Beatlemania was the, the, um, the premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, Rite du Prétent, in, I believe it took place in Paris. And um, so Stravinsky took ballet, he took music to this new level of demonic chaos and intensity. And, uh, you know, because the Rite of Spring as a ballet depicts the, I believe it's the ritual sacrifice of a virgin or something like that in a pagan culture. That's so the Rite du Prétent, you know, oh, it's a high culture Stravinsky ballet. <laughs> this is a, a glorification of, of, of uh, the savage and the occult and uh, demonic demonic rituals. So if we listen to Stravinsky, or, or people in that musical school, you know, they're they're creating ugliness on purpose and calling it beauty. They're looking at you and say, say, no, this isn't beautiful. This isn't ugly. This is beautiful. All your common sense tells you it's ugly, but you're required to believe it's beautiful. Children, children. Yeah, ch well, children's toys. Well, that's another area. Yeah, you know, they make all these children's toys that look, that are monsters. That have uh, all these children's stories that they, they depict monsters as something good. You know, hug the dragon, kiss the monster, all this kind of thing. This is the normalization of the of the demonic. Okay, so it matters is not truth, but feeling. You have to just have intense feeling. And of course, it's all connected to charlatanry. Uh, a lot of these people are just charlatans. But again, it's not only charlatans. They're also, they're all yes, they have a demonic purpose. Um, Father Seraphim actually, in in the book, he only talks about visual art. But as we said last week, uh, musical, uh, the power of music is very great. And uh, I would, I would, my my opinion is that music is more powerful than visual art. Music really captures people. the The whole cult of rock music has utterly destroyed youth. It goes, it goes directly, it bypasses the rational, it goes directly to their subconscious and, and also directly wires their um, physiological responses to things. And uh, you can have a, a child from a, a pious family and they go off and they go to, uh, they off, they go off to their friend's house and start seeing their posters of rock bands, listening to the rock music, and they, they're changed. And you can't convince them that this is bad. It's a form of irrational uh, initia uh, demonic initiation. Uh, also, Father Seraphim does not cover vitalist literature. He only covers, in the book, he just covers art, uh, visual art. But vitalism is manifested uh, in vitalist literature. The thrilling, I, I mentioned that before, uh, crime novels, obscene crime and sex literature. Um, and then the pseudo religious character of fantasy and science fiction literature just captures people and it becomes a substitute for the real transcendence of prayer and, and, uh, of the church. And then the, 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 there's a long section of vitalism in religion, which is obviously where all this is going. This is all a substitute for religion, for, for the Christian faith. There are various types of vitalist uh, religion. We've talked already about the seances and the spiritualism. Um, then there's just the whole, the force. You know, the, you know the, the Star Wars movies, they talk about the force. Well, this is a, they didn't just make that up. You know, the, the, this is a part and parcel of the whole American um, obsession with positive thinking. You know, just think positive thoughts and get in touch with positive feelings and get in touch with positive energies. Including the funeral. Oh, the funerals. I mean, we're at, we're Everybody's they're at, laughing. They're laughing and being, yeah, so-called happy. We're thinking, we're going to think happy thoughts. And, uh, and uh, yeah, the, you know, the, the Roman Catholic Church completely changed their whole funeral liturgy. Uh, they, 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 don't, they, um, it's all about the persons in heaven, and they're 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 glorified, and they're with Christ now, and we don't have to worry about them. And no, there's no they the, they couldn't completely get rid of pr the idea of praying for the soul. So they, it's in a little bits and pieces. I'll talk about. They'll, they'll, but they almost never refer now to forgiving their sins or the possibility of condemnation. It's just dropped completely. That's a billion people. So the Roman Catholic Church is the largest Christian body, a billion people, one six or whatever the world's population, and they went from having a funeral rituals that were a great deal like the Orthodox. They were talking about the forgiveness of sins, praying for the soul, God's judgment, and so forth, to whoop, it all disappears. We're just happy now. Happy, wappy time. And, uh, uh, the, the, and um, so positive thinking, uh, getting in touch with positive energies, and so forth and so on. Then, of course, 
there's another vitalist type of pseudo religion is the fascination with Eastern wisdom and going to gurus. And they're actually this this and now this has become widespread. It's just everybody. Uh, you see all these uh, soccer moms and and, and uh, boring middle class people going to yoga. It's like yoga. Yoga is being offered as this wonderful uh, thing for your health and all that sort of thing. And these are extremely ancient uh, postures and movements designed to attract demonic energy. Church, yes, there's a the the Greek the Greek Orthodox Church in Saint Clair Shore sponsors yoga classes. And uh, I know, I know the teacher. Oh. They they don't believe in or care about spiritual warfare, the reality of spiritual warfare. Oh, or they know and they're pushing it. Well, I, well, as they say, don't don't ascribe malice when you can ascribe ignorance. But after all, it's hard to not to ascribe malice. But um, so Eastern wisdom, gurus, and then occultism, spiritism. We've talked about that. Oh, the self-realization movements. Life is about self-realization. So you have this whole explosion in self-help literature. You're trying to to realize your potential, you see, and this is a this is very typical of Americans, right? Where they they always want to improve and progress, progress, and and uh, become better people through self-realization. Then, of course, there's the obvious stuff like drug cults. Back in the '60s, we had Timothy Leary and Carlos Castaneda, um, where they were they were claiming drugs was this drugs were sacred. They were a gateway to the transcendent, right? To sur pardon me, well, to death, yes, and to before death to the demonic. To the demonic, um, so they're 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 glorifying the glorification of, of drugs. Back in the sixties, we had this this explosion of the glorification of drugs as something positive, and uh, and also this is tied with Carlos Castaneda's books in the sixties. This was tied to um, Native American religion. Well, the Native Americans, the the red people, were more spiritual than white people because they were in touch with spirits, and uh, they take they, yes, they chew peyote peyote buttons. And have these, of course, what they're doing, this, they're just, this is just getting in touch with good old-fashioned shamanism. The shamans, uh, uh, shamanism is, of course, a, a phenomenon throughout the globe, a part of primitive, so-called primitive religions. Of course, even the term primitive is, uh, no, well, they, they had fallen away from God. Um, remember, the whole, the whole idea of something being primitive is based on a, an evolutionary model, where everyone starts out at this primitive level and they advance to higher levels, you see. But actually, we know from the Holy Scriptures that people, all people started at a higher level and they degenerated and became more and more demonized. And so the so-called primitive cultures are really simply the most degenerate culture, the ones that have fallen the lowest, you see, and, they're, they're in, and, they're, and their religion consists entirely in, in, in um, demonic, basically demonic activity. Um, so, uh, so, there's, so the drug cults and so forth. Now, philosophically... <laughs> Now we get to the philosophy. See, see, it's going through every aspect of society and all kinds of activities. And then in philosophy, you have the philosophy of existentialism and personalism. Personalism is important for us right now because personalism is the theology of the ecumenical patriarchate. And its court theologian, a, a bishop named John Zizulus. Personal he's yes, he's very, very, very evil. Um, and and uh, not only in the ecumenical patriarchate, now the Serbian patriarchate is promoting him. I don't know if he's being promoted in Romania. So Personalism is that religion is encounter with the other. Right? This is none of this. None of this is very intelligent. It's it's covered up with intelligent sounding verbiage, but it's actually very vague and, and very vague and meaningless ideas. So, is this a coexist? Uh, pardon me. Is this a coexist? Coexist. Yes, it's part of coexist. Yes, encounter with the other. So uh, let's go back to, to, to understand personalism, we have to go back to existentialism. The existentialists assume that Christian revelation is not objectively true. You can't just believe the Bible. You can't just even believe your mind. You can't believe anything. We're total, we're total, we're, you're, a, you're a blank slate. You have to create your own existence. You have to stand out. You have to stand up and stand out away from the abyss of nothingness and create yourself by leading a life of integrity where you are creative and, and you um, create an existence for yourself. You define your existence and you define it. And uh, the, the, the openly nihilist existentialists like Sartre Camus say you're, you, ref, you define your existence by murdering somebody or just by, by being a complete reprobate. The so-called Christian existentialists say you, you, or the religious existentialists or humanistic existentialists say you define yourself by showing love for the other. 
I and Thou, Martin Buber, this Jewish existential wrote a famous book called I and Thou. So all of life is this personal encounter. Of course, it's all very vague. It doesn't really, it doesn't, it doesn't, it offers no basis whatsoever for a coherent theological or philosophical worldview. It's superficial, right? Irrational. And it's irrational, right? So any kind of I thou encounter is sacred. So if I want to encounter, you see, Pope Francis is encountering uh, the, the, the street people and prostitutes by washing their feet on Holy Thursday. Isn't that beautiful? You know, he's encountering them. This is an I thou personalistic encounter and they're, they're creating relationship. Although they're not, it's just a farce, right? It's a, it's a parody. Okay. And uh, so what personalism does, personalism is a, a new theology or a new philosophy within ecumenist Christianity saying, well, we have to overcome, we're ecumenists, we have to overcome our theological obstacles. So we're going to create a whole new theological system based on personal encounter. I'm the patriarch, you're the pope, but we encounter each other and we discover Christ between each other. It's just blah, blah. <laughs> it's just vague, it's absurd. But then Zeus Eulis is clever enough to take this into Trinitarian theology and say that what, what matters is not the divine it's not the divine, the, 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 uh, the, what matter, what the, the, the starting point is not the divine nature, but the personal relationship among the people of the Trinity, but he defines it in these very anthropomorphic terms. And Zizulus is actually an Arian because he says that the, be the begetting of the Son is a decision by the Father. It's, it's a, a, because everything has to be personal, an act of will. We're getting, we're back to the will. The will is everything. So the begetting of the Son is an act of will by the Father, which is precisely one of the Arian positions back in the fourth century. It is precisely Arianism. So the, the core theologian, the official theologian of the Ecumenical Patriarchate is an Arian. I mean, at least, <laughs> or at best, I should say, he's an Arian. All right, but, but who, was the great dis who was the great apostle of personalism? John Paul II. So if you're observing the Roman Catholic scene, and we have to because they still have enormous influence, right? They have over large numbers of people. <clears throat> And they've been hijacked, they've been used as this giant vehicle for spreading all these ideas and destroying all these people. So the, all, all the popes, since John Twenty-Third, who was a 32nd degree Mason, right, all these popes have been re totally rewriting their whole theology. So, and they're all, Benedict, Benedict the, the previous pope, uh, the one before this one, said, I didn't like the old-fashioned theology in, in, uh, in Eisen Seminary, I like the new 20th century philosophy, Heidegger and so forth, uh, phenomenology and so forth. So they're creating a new theology based on this personal encounter. We, 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 we go to a deep personal encounter, we encounter each other, we realize that our encounter overcomes our differences. It's just, it's just nonsense, right? But, but it's, it's clothed, if you, they, they write books and books this thick, <laughs> trying to clothe all this stuff in a respectable garb, but it's just, it's just nonsense. But what they're emphasizing though is the intensity of the experience. It's a very intense experience. I go to a World Council of Churches meeting, and there's me, the Catholic bishop, and there's me, the Orthodox monk, and there's the shaman from Africa. And we have a ritual together, and we feel this thrill. We feel this electric energy going through us. Well, you know what that energy is coming from, right? But they call it love. And this, this becomes the ba this personal encounter is the basis for unity. So um, the, the, this is a very serious assault on Orthodox tradition. Okay, and on, on the theology of the Father. This is going on within the highest ranks of patriarchates and bishops in the Orthodox Church. Okay. Father Seraphim summarizes in paragraph 21, all these vitalist manifestations of the religious impulse share in common a hostility to what? Here is very important. A hostility to any stable or unchanging doctrine or institution and a paramount concern with and pursuit of the immediate values of life, vitality, experience, awareness, ecstasy, Constant change, the restless search for constant excitement, nothing stable. So now let's go on and define vitalism. Now that's led us to the point where we can now define vitalism, vitalism precisely as nihilism. Liberalism is indifferent to ultimate truth, but its adherents want the comfort and prestige that the old truths give. Okay. Realism attacks the old ultimate truths with a claim to a more true, lesser truth of materialistic reductionism. But rea so liberalism and realism are in a dialogue about what's truth. They're still talking about what's the old question, what's truth. They have terrible answers, <laughs> but they're coming up, they'll, they'll, you know, liberalism says, ah, uh, yeah, there's truth, but let's not worry about it. Let's just, you know, go on with life and make progress. Realists say, no, we're going to talk about truth. 
and we do, we've defined truth now as ma materialism. Okay? Vitalism ignores the question of truth altogether and devotes itself to other concerns. Vitalism ignores the question. We've now, vitalism brings to the stage of it, all that matters is experience and feeling. Truth is a non-question for them. Okay. So I'm going to read, I reproduce paragraph 23 in full, which is very important. The falseness of an opinion, says Nietzsche, <clears throat> is not for us any objection to it. And say that again. The falseness of an opinion, if for us, we have no objections to it being false. The question is how far an opinion is life-furthering, life-preserving. When such pragmatism begins, Father Seraphim says, now this passes into the vitalist stage, which may be defined as the elimination of truth as the criterion of human action. So, so, this, so this, the, the, the materialists are saying they still want truth. Truth is that we're just, we're just sending for monkeys. But that's truth, and we base our life on that. We're just sending for monkeys. They're still looking for a, tru a truth. The vitalists are saying we don't care whether it's true or not. We'll believe it if it feels good. And that's good. That's our new good. Right? The substitution of a new standard, the life-giving, the vital. It's the final divorce of life from truth. We want life without truth. We want to feel it. As long as you feel it. And there are Orthodox people who are in danger of this. Well, I don't care about, I don't care about the dogmas of the church. I just want to feel happy when I'm in church. I want to feel that Christ is present when I'm in church. Well, the devil can give you those feelings. Right? This feeling, they, may sub they substitute feeling for what is supra-rational. It is true that orthodoxy transcends the rational, but a lot of people mistake sub-rational good feelings for transcendent feelings. If I go into church and I just feel good, I light a candle and I feel good, that's from God. So don't bother me about all these, the creed and the canons and rules. Those are just, I'm, I'm, I'm beyond that. I'm spiritual. I've had orthodox people tell me, Father, don't bother me with the rules. I'm spiritual. And they were not spiritual. These are not people living in hermitages or practicing celibacy or fasting. These are just, these are just people leading very worldly lives but who would come to church and they'd feel spiritual. I knew someone who actually knew Seraphim Rose. They'd also, they'll, they'll claim elders as their excuse for claiming they're spiritual. I knew someone who knew Seraphim Rose, and I would, I would try to talk to this. It was a, it was a woman, a middle-aged middle mother, but who just wouldn't agree about fasting or wouldn't agree about very basic aspects of the church. She said, Father, you don't understand. I knew Father Seraphim Rose. I'm spiritual. You don't understand me because you're not spiritual. So what can you do with that? Um, another example. Uh, I had a woman, when in the 90s, a lot of these young women would come from Russia. They were pouring in from Russia. And they'd all had multiple abortions. They were all married three times to Bolsheviks and Jews and, and uh, Satanists. And, and um, it was a terrible uh, problem. And so one time, one time a woman, uh, there was a, a priest friend of mine from a different jurisdiction. He was there for the vigil service. And um, he was leaving as, as this woman was leaving also. And she had come to confession to me, and I, she had some basic moral problems, and I said, well, you know, these are the teachings of the church, and, you know, these things are sins, and we have to have a kanona, a canon, and we have to prepare for communion, and, and so on. She left, she was going out, and um, the priest said, oh, well, uh, that priest who had left, my friend said, oh, Father Stephen, uh, he's a nice priest, whatever, you know, said something nice about me. And she said, you don't understand, she said, he's not a spiritual priest. In Russia, we have spiritual priests, they don't talk about canons and sins, they're just spiritual, and I feel good when I go to them. But this is very widespread. Okay? It's a substitution of simply uh, positive feeling for the, for the genuinely transcendent, for that which is supra-rational. No catechism. No catechism. No, 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 again, they're not concerned with the stable, unchanging nobody truths. They, of course, nobody's teaching. I'm not blaming, I'm not saying this is a bad person. God knows nobody taught her. Of no. course not. I'm not saying she was... Uh, malicious. No, no one had taught her. Yeah, but the priest would reinforce this. Oh yeah, you've had 20 abortions, sure, just go to communion, you see. And because uh, I feel love for you. We all feel love. We go in the church, we like the candle, we feel love. We all feel love. Well, how, how do you know where the feelings are coming from? You know, so there's no, no discernment. Vitalism, this whole vitalism thing destroys discernment. And it really boils down to if it feels good, do it. <laughs> You know, we, we've talked for an hour now, but it really it boils down to if it feels good, do it. But, but, they, but they dress it up in all these different uh, robes that you have to... So we're forced to go through all this and identify all these different movements, all these different um, facets of culture and society that all express this fundamentally demonic, very simple, crude demonic idea.
something for everybody. So it's something for everybody. That's right. It's a big department store, and if you don't like, if you're interested in clothes, go to the clothing department. If you're interested in sports, go to the sporting department. If you're interested in music, go to the music department. But it's all expressing the same revolt against truth and a revolt against, and also glorification of the passions and revolt against isikia. You know that we, uh, the whole Orthodox life should be characterized by isikia, which means stillness. We're, of course, we're not very still. We're just worldly people, but at least we're, we know we're supposed to be striving for stillness, for the healing of the passions, calming of the passion, the union of the mind with the heart. And, um, but it's all based on objective truth, on, on the reality of who Christ is, right, on logos. Christ is the logos, the ultimate meaning of all things. And all this is the rejection of logos. It's all the rejection uh, of logos. <coughs> okay. um, <clears throat> so vitalism is a logical progression from realism. Realism claims to find the really real in sense experience, in science. Vitalism takes this to a logical next step. Everything is reduced to subjective experience and sensation. So the vitalists say, all right, you say everything is in sensation. All right, we agree with you. But we're just going to take the sensation and not ascribe any truth to it. The solid basis of, that scientism claims is not solid at all. It's going way back to Hume, remember our friend David Hume. Pure empiricism cannot demonstrate coherently that, one's sense, that one sense experience is a necessary connection to any other sense experience. So uh, uh, scientism is on sand because by claiming that everything is purely empirical, they deny the connection of any one phenomenon to any other phenomenon. Right? So vitalism says, forget it, forget truth. Just multiply and intensify your experiences. By the way, this leads to the fundamental tenet of postmodernism. And now we're now in, we're going to talk about later on. When we get through nihilism. We're going to talk about postmodernism because that's where we are now. We're beyond nihilism now. We're into postmodernism, which is that any set of phenomena is liable to have an infinite number of plausible explanations. Now let me say that again. This is total insanity, right? The fundamental tenet of postmodernism, which is the philosophical so-called school that dominates all the universities. These are the people teaching our children. Any set of phenomena is liable to have an infinite number of plausible explanations. Mad madness. It's madness, exactly. You make up what, if you have the power, you have tenure, you can make up whatever you want and call it philosophy. So what are the results of vitalism? Uh, Father Seraphim starts this, this, this section by saying, the, the logic of unbelief leads inexorably to the abyss. Obviously, this is where all, all this is going to the abyss, right? He who will not return to the truth must follow error to its end. You have to, we have to go back to Christ. The whole point of this whole course is that the, we have to go back to orthodoxy. The unraveling started. We go back to our classes on the High Middle Ages. The unraveling started with the departure from orthodox. And it's all this ineluctable process leading to where we are now. All standards of judgment in religion... Okay, now we're talking about the results of vitalism. All standards of judgment in, all standards of judgment in religion and art and so forth, all of these things, are reduced to excitement originality, authenticity, just subjective rigmarole. The critics go and say, oh, how authentic, oh, how, how meaningful, how creative. It's just nonsense, right, subjective rigmarole. It leads to obscurantism, in other words, uh, not dealing with truth. Obscurantism means, I don't, want, don't, don't tell me nothing about what's real. Don't, I don't want to know about, hear about the truth. And, and being charlatans, just people being phonies, right? Criticism by the art critics and all, any social critics, any critic, is reduced to apologia for the latest genius, brainwashing the multitudes into believing in this genius. Marketing. But the latest idea, this guy's a genius. The Beatles are great musicians. Um, Derrida is a great philosopher. Um, you know, Obama's a great president, whatever. And then you just brainwash the masses, right, into this. It's just marketing, right? Mass hypnosis. Um, the search for truth is never ending. So there's a search for truth. I'm searching. Don't tell me I have to accept the church's teaching. I'm searching for truth. I have to go on searching all my life. I'm always searching. Okay. The search is never ending. So the only, in this idea, the only moral life is to keep wandering in this hall of mirrors. I'm authentic, right? I'm, wa I, I'm, I'm searching. You're not searching. You've settled on these dogmatic truths from this old dusty church, but I'm searching, right? So the only immorality is to claim you know the truth. Right? In this idea, morality means not knowing truth and searching and just having experiences. And it's immoral to claim you know the truth, right? Remember, you're intolerant. You're not authentic, right? So it's, they, they glorify skepticism. It's the romantic figure of the eternal pilgrim in search of something or other. He's in search. He's just in search, right? There's never any end in sight. Where it's, where it's the bright Soviet future. It's always over the horizon. You're never there, right? If you want a real answer, you lack... If you want a real answer, if you want a solid answer, well, you lack authenticity, 
hey, man, you're not authentic, man. You want some simplistic answer? No, let's just search. We're just going to have experiences and search. This whole thing, this whole mindset, this whole way of living is a demonic parody of man's thirst for God, the never-ending process of being sated with God. Indeed, indeed, the saints in heaven are always growing in their knowledge of and their love for God. Even on earth, we Orthodox should be always be growing. And we are pilgrims going to our heavenly homeland, and we're growing in, in our love for God, but we're not, we're, we're not rejecting the earlier truths that the church taught us, right? The objective truths of the church, the, the dogmas of the church, the revelation of Holy Scripture, these are solid truths. And we just, we have to stand on those solid truths, and we, we hope to grow in our knowledge and love for God, and our service to God and neighbor, right? That's the true pilgrimage, right? But this so-called pilgrimage is just refusing to grow up, refusing to accept the truth, and just seeking more and more and stranger and more varied experiences. And uh, now people do it through drugs, they do it through fantasy movies, um, they, they do it through sexual experimentation, and they, they destroy themselves. Um, it's it, it's um, guaranteed that if someone pursues this way of life, where they're constantly seeking new and more exciting experiences, they will destroy themselves. And inevitably leads to the destruction of the personality and even physical uh, their physical demise. Is there more? Fahrenheit. Where they burn all the books? Yeah, but they also have in each house. Mm -hmm. The goal is to have four huge television. Screens. Yes, in Fahrenheit 451, the the housewife of the protagonist is disgusted. His wife is disgusted because she only has one giant TV on one wall. He's writing back in the 1950s, and he's describing people with televisions to cover a whole wall. Also, you are part of role. You are doing role playing. You're doing role playing within it. You are part of the yes. action. Yes, and they sew the the transmitter into your ear. They call it a seashell, and the little speaker is sewn into your ear, so you hear it 24 hours a day. Like the people who can't give up their phone 24 hours a day, right? They, they, they. You know, like children should never go to sleep with the radio on, or a computer or stuff like that, right? Because it's it's subconsciously coming into their, all this stuff is coming into their minds. I remember being in a home, I was shocked, a, uh, a parishioner's home, oh, this was 25 years ago. And it was a pious family that said prayers every day, and the men wanted to be a deacon and so forth and so on. They put their children to sleep watching cartoons and movies, you see. But why? They, nobody had told them. I, they were surprised when I told them, but they listened. They stopped doing it, but nobody had told them, don't do that. <laughs> so, yeah, in Fahrenheit 451, they, 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 she wants every, all four walls covered with television screens, right? So she's immersed in this imaginary experience. It's leaving real life and just going to the completely... They have a group. The non-real. They have a group of ladies. And the group of ladies, yes. That all participating in this. Have you seen that? Yeah. I'll try to find it. I'll yeah, I've never it. seen the movie, oh, but I've read the book. Oh, the movie is fantastic. It's, it's powerful. Oh. Yeah. I'll, I'll find it. Yes. I'll have it somewhere. So, um... So, uh, so obviously, but we have obviously we have. Um, oh, let me let me finish with Father Seraphim's conclusion. Realism in its rage for truth destroys truth. Okay, so realism is raging for truth. Well, I want the truth. I don't bother me with all that metaphysics and religion. I just want the facts. That's truth. So they're obsessed with truth, but of course they destroy truth because uh, that's not the truth. But in the same way, vitalism in its very quest for life smells of death. This all smells of corruption. Right? It's all headed for death. And that death, getting back to Hitler and Nuremberg, you know, at, at those rallies, those people were thrilled, right? They were full of life, but contained in it, within the national, the pagan mythos of Germany, was the concept of Götterdämmerung. Everything's going to be destroyed. Uh, the, the, Nord the Nordic people call it Ragnarok. There's this final destruction, this glorious destruction in fire. Everything is destroyed at the end. So it's a glorification of destruction, which, if you're a pagan, that makes sense because without Christ, that is the end of life, is destruction, you see. Um, so it, uh, it, in the very quest for excitement, in the very quest for the thrill, the, their quest for getting in touch with uh, your primitive nature, there's, of course, this death and corruption. Because of what? Because of original sin. <laughs> because we're, we're mortal human beings, right? And, and if we just seek to live off of our uh, passions uh, and 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 we can only, we exhaust our passions, then to get more thrills, we have to go to demonic energies, right, to feel alive. That's just human, that's just anthropology. That's just the way we're made, because of our full, and that's because of our fallen nature. That's the way we are. So really the answer is still, it's obviously in the church, and it's obviously people need to be catechized and exorcised and baptized. They need to go to confession, just stay close to the church. They need to avoid all these influences. 
Um, so we said, even though uh, tonight we talked a lot about 19th century or maybe 1950s or 1960s phenomena and so forth, this is all with us. Right? This is all going on right now. It's just in a more more advanced stage. So we have to, um, this should encourage us to really pray, to go more deeply in, into reading uh, about prayer yes, and reading our scriptures, reading reading the fathers. You know, when we say the creed, what a powerful thing the creed is. You know, we say the creed, twice a day we say the creed. I believe in God, well, it's part of our morning prayers, night prayers, right? But if we just stopped and said each each article of the creed with, with attention and realized that this is truth, right? This is life triumphing over death. This is truth triumphing over falsehood. And, and th this truth saves us. And Christ said the truth will make us free. So we have to realize that all, the, all this, from a worldly point of view, all this seems overwhelming, right? Because this anti-culture is all around us. And it's from a human point of view, it seems like it's like the perfect storm, that there's no way out of it. But actually, it's very direct. Now, we, we realize we're actually blessed to live in this time. Because uh, like the fathers in the desert or like the early martyrs, we're just in direct contact. We're in direct warfare with the demonic. And we just have to fight it with the church's weapons. And the church's weapons are very straightforward. They're very simple. Um, so let's love the church, love our orthodoxy, and just be really humble. We have to be really, really humble. And, and you know, Constantine pointed out a couple of times tonight, you can't blame these people, right? Nobody taught them. They're caught in a perfect trap. They're caught in a perfect storm, right? And this is just people out there. These are our own relatives, friends, right? Could be children, could be in-laws, could be uh, students, uh, colleagues. Um, so we're not talking about people out there. We're talking about our own beloved, right? The people closest to us. And, and uh, we have to redouble our efforts to pray, to love the church, to go more deeply into um, preparing for confession, examining our own souls, um, and really praying, praying, praying for people. I was, today in the Today was the Nativity of the Theotokos. In the homily today, I want to stress Saints Joachim and Anna relying on prayer, and that we don't go deeply enough into prayer. You know, we don't, we don't, we want to use our minds to figure everything out, um, and we sometimes there's the only answer is just prayer. The answer is really prayer, and the church's solutions, which uh, seems simplistic to modern people, but you know, oh, you just pray, or you just have a relic of the saints, or you just go to communion, or how could that fix things? But they don't realize. The, this is the answer. It's nice. It's simple. It's simple. It's really straightforward, right? Remember Naaman the Syrian in, in the, the fourth book of Kings. Naaman, the captain of Damascus, comes to Eliseus, the prophet, the, the disciple of Elias, and um, he wants to be cured of leprosy. And, and uh, the prophet sends his servant out to talk to Naaman's servant, saying, tell the captain to go dip himself three times in the Jordan, and he'll be healed. And Naaman says, wait a second. I came all the way from Damascus to see this prophet. I wanted him to, to do a ritual, to say prayers, to chant, do something over me, right? Do something impressive. And he just has to go be dipped in the Jordan. And then uh, the servant, his servant is wise. His servant says, Master, if the man of God had told you to do something difficult, would you have done it? He said, well, of course. He said, well, he told you to do something simple. Why don't you try it? <laughs> so, and, and that, so often we're, we're like name in the Syrian. We want to think that the answers are complicated. But, you know, we've, this whole course for a whole year now, we've been going for a year now. Next time will be our 30th class. Everything we've presented seems very complex and, and very uh, varied in its subject matter. Um, and sometimes rich in its subject matter, sometimes disturbingly rich in an unhappy subject matter. But actually the, ans the ultimate answer is very simple. We go all the way back to the early church and the fathers and their teaching on prayer they're teaching on uh, the purification of the soul, and it, it all goes back to that. So uh, let's just have hope in Christ, and um, we, we just we need to study these things to recognize them when we see them, kind of put a label on things. We've all seen all of these things. We see them all the time, but if we don't have labels for them, we don't understand they have historical roots. And uh, yes, we have to go more. Yes, yeah. we can't. Oh, my God. oh yeah, we, we're not studying this to get upset. We're studying to say, ah, oh, oh, so that's what that is. Ah, uh -huh. well, now we're going to fight it. We're going to fight indifference to truth with love for truth. We're going to fight um, disordered passions with healing our passions. Right? We're going to fight the degenerate and the so-called primitive with that which is lofty and noble and good. And we're going to fight these false myths with the truth of the Christian faith. We're going to fight phony art and ugly art with beautiful art. We're going to fight demonic music with saving healing music see the, the church has the antidote to all of these all of these things and that's why you know the young Eugene Rose is writing these uh, as a layman to kind of come to grips with what he was experiencing 
through his studies, through his life in San Francisco and so forth and so on. San Francisco was certainly a laboratory of, and still is a laboratory of the degenerate. Um, but um, uh, then he came to the realization, well, the orthodoxy is the only answer. Let's just go more, let's go more deep. He never, in, he never ended up writing that big book on philosophy and history. He, he just said, let's translate the fathers. <laughs> let's do services. That's the answer. Let's turn to the saints. And he met a real saint. He met, he met Archbishop John in San Francisco, St. John. And he met a real saint. Well, this is the answer. The answer to the, the, the false superman of nihilism is the true superman is a saint. That's the, that's the answer. That's no, our answer. No need for more books. Pardon me? No need for more books. More books. Yeah. Need more books. Well, once you meet a saint, you don't, yeah. Once you meet a saint, you see, the, you see it all in action. That's right. That's right.